So I have a super exciting interview for you today. Recently, I had the pleasure of talking to Kat Ellis, who has published five young adult books, the most recent being Wicked Little Deeds, Burden Falls, and Harrow Lake, which were published in 2020 and 2021 by Penguin Random House. Kat Ellis is a young adult thriller and horror author. She describes herself on her website as writing thrillers with a touch of weird. She's a lovely human being, and I had such a wonderful time talking to her, and I'm so excited to share with you the interview we did. We talked a lot about building atmosphere in horror, about young adult voice, and also about about how to scare readers in your writing. So if you're interested in learning more about how to write horror, I highly recommend watching this interview until the end. Without further ado, let's welcome Kat to the channel. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm so, so honored to have you on the channel. Um, could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Uh, I'm an author from North Wales and I write young adult novels. Um, the most recent two novels that I've written, Harrow Lake and Burden Falls, have both been horror thrillers. Uh, before that, um, I do tend to stick to thriller as a genre, but they veer off a little bit into fantasy and one into sci-fi as well. So I write all over the place. Very cool. Yeah, your novels are amazing. I'm very starstruck today being able to have a chat with you about this. <laughs> So today I thought we would talk about horror and a bit about the horror writing craft um, and also about like pacing and how to thrill your readers and, you know, really kind of give them plot twists and clues in the very artful way that you do. So I thought, could we talk about um, what your favorite thing is about horror and what initially drew you to it first? I've always been a big fan of horror, both reading it and watching horror films. Um, even when I was far too young to be watching really scary movies. Uh, so I think it's just been a lifelong love for me. I love a good villain in a movie or in a book. Um, I love the, uh, the fast pace and the real like jump scares as well as the you know, slow build suspense. I think it all just pulls me in as a reader. And when I'm writing something, that's really what I'm trying to achieve is just draw my reader in and keep them hooked right until the very last page. Yeah. Did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? I didn't actually. Uh, I've always enjoyed writing, but it never really occurred to me that maybe that was something that I could do for a job. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until I was in my mid twenties and YA was really having a big boom, you know, with all the Twilight novels and things like that. And I th I'd started reading uh, YA novels and I thought actually this is something I'd really love to write mm -hmm. so I gave it a go yeah I'll it did that. take me it took a few years before <laughs> I went from you know having a go at it to being able to write something that was actually worth submitting to agents or that I thought would be you know something that I'd want people to actually read but yeah it was time well spent and now I'm five books in <laughs> yeah, that's very very cool so what did your writing education look like? You say that you started writing in your mid-20s. Did you start kind of learning how to write young adult novels then? How did you do that? Well, I, I wrote a bit in high school, but it was in university that I really uh, gave creative writing a go because that was part of my degree dissertation. We had the option to either write you know, a very academic study of literature, or we could do, I think it was a, a 10,000 word short story. Oh, that's cool. So I thought, yeah, it sounded like much less like academic work to yeah. me. So I thought, well, <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give that a go. So that was essentially why I started writing. Um, mm. Because I really fell in love with it just from writing that, you know, extended short story. So right. after that, um, I didn't really write too much then after I finished university until, as I said, I was in my mid twenties and just mm -hmm. YA got me hooked on it really. What do you think the most valuable resource was to you when you were learning how to write? Um, I, I did find a really good uh, critique group and community on Twitter, which was you oh, know, cool. a good place to be at the time for, for writers. Um, mm -hmm. I found out a lot about the publishing industry that way as well. Um, loads of online resources that I probably wouldn't have found myself just from googling um, right. and you know lots of creative writing videos on YouTube and stuff like that which is you know the kind of content that you make as well mm -hmm. absolutely vital I think to any sort of uh, beginner writer who wants to you know, build their their chops with writing. 
Yeah, well, that's what I love about YouTube is you get to hear from so many different writers and because everybody has such a unique writing process, really the only way to learn is by experimenting with what works for other people. So you get bombarded with so much information that you can experiment with, which is really cool. Yeah. yeah. So in your opinion, what makes a good horror book? I think it has to be a horror book that builds and carries its reader along with it, has twists that you don't see coming. Mm -hmm. I think horror readers especially tend to read a lot in that genre so they kind of know what tropes to expect so if as a writer you can turn those tropes on their head a little bit that tends to keep it feeling fresh and like something that you haven't read you know a dozen times before because as as much as you love those those tropes from horror because that's I think why readers tend to stick with the genre mm -hmm. you want to to read something that feels like it's new that you haven't haven't read before right so when you're thinking and coming up with ideas for books, do you usually come up with tropes that you want to use and work them into the books? Or do you come up with, or like you decide on tropes that you think are interesting and figure out ways to invert them and build a story around that? How do you interact with tropes? Because I know a lot of horror writers really have a lot to say about tropes. Yeah, I, I don't tend to plan too much on using them, but I notice them cropping up when I'm writing. So then I have to look at that and think, do I want to lean into it or do I want to turn that on its head or just, you know, avoid it altogether? Right. So with my with my book, Harrow Lake, which is the, the last one I had out last year, um, that has quite a lot of horror tropes in it because it is, you know, based on this character who is the daughter of a horror movie director. So right. the fact that she knows about all the tropes of horror means that as I was writing from her perspective, she could see them coming as well. So it gave me a really good chance to sort of play with those a bit and subvert quite a few of them. Yeah, no, that's very cool. So do you have a book of yours that scares you the most? Which book scares you if you had to pick one? I think they've kind of gotten scarier and scarier as I've been allowed to play with that aspect of my writing. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so I think Burden Falls being the most recent is probably the one that I think is the scariest of all of mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I just finished reading that and the way that you describe all of the eyes and the creepy gore stuff just really sticks with you. Like the imagery is just so visceral. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I think the using the, the creepy eyes in it, it, it tends to be a bit of a, a signature of mine. I would say that I tend to have some kind of a landmark type feature like the eyes in this in, in uh, Burden Falls and in Harrow Lake. Uh, it was teeth. So this sort of recurring image that tends to crop up throughout the book. And I think it sort of sinks under reader's skin a bit that way. If you have this sort of image that seems to be everywhere in the setting. Yeah, definitely. That actually bleeds really well into my next question, because I want to talk a little bit about atmosphere, because you just have this way of creating really tangible, suffocating atmosphere that's very like, I I, I don't really know how you do it, because atmosphere is a very hard thing to create. And it's also a hard thing to talk about and teach because it's a really subtle thing. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you do when you're trying to create atmosphere that unsettles readers. For me, I think a lot of it stems from the setting and the setting is one of the first things that comes to my head when I'm starting to plan a new story. Mm -hmm. uh, the setting tends to be something that I really want to hone in on before I ever start writing a draft. Mm -hmm. I get an idea of not specifically the geographical location, but certain landmarks that I want to include within my setting. So mm -hmm. in Harrow Lake, we had um, the lake itself but obviously old mining tunnels that were around the town where the monster lives and there's a, a creepy old tree which sort of feeds into the local town folklore because the locals in Harrow Lake believe that if they hang their uh, lost teeth from the branches of the tree it keeps the monster from coming to get them so I think when you have sort of markers within your setting you can use those build them in to the plot and have them working for you I know a lot of uh, a lot of writers seem to use setting as another character, and I think that works really well as a concept to sort of view your setting as an extra character, because it has to be feeding into the plot. It has to be driving things and creating that atmosphere that you really want to be looking for as a horror writer. Right. 
And do you have specific ways, because I know you were mentioning like using repeated mentions of the teeth or the eyes. Are there mm -hmm. other, like, do you choose details before you start writing that pertain to the setting that you repeat over and over again to help build that atmosphere? I, I do have some in my head when I start drafting, but a lot of um, those key details that are going to build the atmosphere when you're reading the finished book, I add those in during the revisions because I like to do, um, my revisions tend to go be a matter of layering really. So I will do a whole revision passes looking specifically at um, certain features that I think add to the atmosphere, the, the geography of the place. Is this particular setting working for that scene? Could I make it scarier by changing the setting, changing the location that certain events play out? If I, you know, create a sealed environment that obviously is going to increase the tension for any horror scene. So how can I do that within a certain setting? You know, it's easier if you're locked in a house than it is if you're in a forest. But, right. you know, you can you can create your own barriers and obstacles that are going to keep your characters trapped. And that's something that really increases the tension when you're writing horror. Yeah, absolutely. What does the editing process look like for you? How many passes do you usually do and how long does it take to get from starting the book to publishing or not publishing, but being finished with the book? That's kind of a tricky one to answer because I don't necessarily do clean passes. Um, I would say that I do three good drafts before anybody lays eyes on it. And that includes my critique partners whose you know, opinions I value greatly and they help me to improve my drafts immensely. Mm -hmm. um, after that, I will tend to do several lighter passes, just looking at specific passages or specific things like the like the the setting elements that I want to make sure are working as hard as they possibly can. Mm -hmm. And then once I've done that and included any notes that I get back from my critique partners, that's usually when my agent would see it. So right. she would give me some notes usually as well. And then I'd do some more revisions. So it's probably about six or seven fullish drafts before it it would go and be in the hands of an editor at a publishing house. Right. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, critique partners are the best. <laughs> I love them. They are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you have some really gory deaths and creepy murders in your book that are very visually described. And when I was reading it, like I could picture it very clearly in my head. And I know that when people watch horror movies, like often it's easier to get that kind of gory, jump scary, creepy image into people's minds because they can see it in front of them. But with writing, it's a little bit harder. So do you have any like tips for creating those really graphic images that can stick with readers even after they've finished reading? Oh, definitely. Um... And I think actually one of the one of the key devices that you can use as a horror writer rather than somebody who's creating a horror film is that you can use the reader's own imagination. So mm -hmm. a lot of the things that you would show as you know jump scares in a horror movie, you can allow that to play out in the reader's own imagination. And if they're reading a horror, they're looking to be scared and leaning into these markers that are showing them a scare is on the way so a lot of the work can be done within the reader's own mind right. but also one of the one of the plus plus sides of writing horror rather than watching it mm. is that in a horror movie you have you know the sense of sight and sound so you can see and hear what your main character or what's being presented on the screen mm. but in a horror novel you're writing well I'm writing from the main character's point of view so yeah. you can not only see and hear what they're seeing and hearing but you can smell taste and touch everything right. that's around them as well so you have those extra senses to work with you can add in details that wouldn't make it into a film so you can't you know you can't smell that smell that triggers a memory for them right. you can't you know you're, you're not feeling something that just reminds them of the feel of a dead body so those sorts of details, I think you can really work. So are you an outliner or do you like to do a lot of discovery writing? How do you plot your books? I do plot. I try not to plot in massive detail because I find that I have such a poor attention span that if I plot it out in minute scene by scene detail, I tend to either find that I'm getting a bit bored because it feels like I've already written it mm -hmm. or I just go off course and then all of that work that I've done 
outlining it needs to be redone then because I've veered off course and I can't use it. But I do use a broad framework. Um, I tend to know what my end point is going to be and I know some key blocks along the way. So I do, I do like to plan because I think if I free write something, it just ends up being a bit of a mess basically. So yeah, I definitely do plot, but I like to leave some elements um, for discovery writing as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think that with horror books, do you have different plot beats that you like to hit as you're trying to create a horror plot? Or do you use, use like the traditional three act structure? Are there special like plot elements that are pertaining only to horror? I tend to basically use the three act structure, but then I find when I'm revising, I look at the different beats as points where I can make sure that my pacing is right. So I, yeah. I will use um, more like a save the cat type of beat sheet structure. Mm -hmm. And I will use that to revise and make sure that I've hit key markers that I think will keep the, the pacing and the tension tight. I just finished, as I mentioned before, reading Burden Falls. And so a couple of my questions are pertaining to that just because it's fresh on my mind. But you have some really amazing plot twists in there and plot twists that I just really didn't expect. I remember I was reading the book and I had this thought, I was like, oh, it's definitely not gonna be this one character. And you know, there are all these different things that end up happening that were really unexpected. So do you, when you're outlining and plotting, do you like to plan out your plot twists in advance or do those kind of come to you as you are discovery writing? How do you deal with dropping clues earlier in the narrative that people can piece together later once the big reveal happens? Well, first of all, thank you very much. I'm glad that you didn't see the twist coming. <laughs> um, but yes, when I'm plotting it out, I usually have an ending in mind. As I said, when I have my sort of broad framework of an outline, I know where I want it to end up. But if when I get there, it feels like the ending that I originally planned isn't going to be a surprise if it's not going to be, you know, something that feels satisfying after you know the big build up that you've taken to get there right I think then I I will obviously change the ending and if that requires me to go back and then seed uh, different clues or point in a different direction during revisions that's when I'll probably go and do that I quite like the backtracking when you've got your full draft you can then go back and look at it and think, right, when when does that clue need to be put there? When does this character need to start acting a little bit shady? When does the main character need to start suspecting them? Because I think if you're writing, I mean, all of my books tend to have an element of mystery to them. Mm -hmm. And I think as a reader, you feel a bit cheated if you reach the, the end of the mystery mm -hmm. and it's completely you know, just come out of nowhere if you feel that there weren't clues that were pointing that way. So right. I like to make sure that, you know, a reader who is looking for that element that they want to puzzle out themselves, they will get there and they will feel smart for figuring it out. Yeah. So it's still kind of a, a satisfying conclusion, even if they figured out who who the big bad was. I mean, I'm not going to say who it was in Burden <laughs> Yeah, if you, if you see the twist coming, uh, that's that's fine as long as it doesn't seem too obvious too early. Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, a, it sounds like it would be very tricky to balance making sure that the clues are there, but not too obvious so that not very many people will guess them. I know I always struggle with that in my writing. I don't know if it's too obvious or not obvious enough. So it's, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely tricky. <laughs> yeah, that's where test readers can help you as well, isn't it? When you have those early beta reads and they can say, you know, leave a note to say, this is where I start to suspect so-and-so. And whether that turns turns out to be correct or not is uh, something that you can work with then as you sort of revise the final book. Definitely. Yeah. So you also have really amazing teen narrators in your books that have very distinct voices. I was wondering if you might be able to share a little bit about how you are able to develop those teen voices and how you make them sound really authentic. Well, I... I read an awful lot of YA and I tend to watch a lot of uh, teen focused television programs, especially. And I think that because I don't have teenage children of my own, I think doing that is something that is really important for me to be able to sort of keep it sounding natural and keep the characters feeling like they are authentic people. Mm -hmm. um, and also trying to just kind of harken back to when I was that age, 
and how I viewed the world then and what interactions I would have with the people around me, whether it's my friends or my family and trying to keep that perspective in my mind. And I think as I tend to write first person point of view anyway, once you're in that mindset and in that voice, it mm. does tend to come naturally as you sort of go through the draft. And then as you're revising as well, you can make sure that the whole thing reads seamlessly from that voice, because I know it can change from the beginning of a draft to when you know your character better at the end. So yeah. that's another part of my revision is making sure that the voice reads the same throughout. Do you have a favorite point of view that you like to write? in when you're writing mysteries and thrillers? I like to keep it first person because then the reader's discovering um, as at the same time as the main character. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to be involved with the main character, discovering all the clues and figuring things out. And I have written one, one and a half books that were in third person points of view. And I do enjoy that. It gives it a different tone. Mm -hmm. And I think there's something a little bit more whimsical about going third person, even, you know, especially when there's like some creepy element to it. I, I think it can work really, really well. But I think first person just helps me get to know my characters better. So that tends to be the one I gravitate towards. Yeah, it's my favorite, too. <laughs> it makes it all feel super visceral, especially when stuff is happening that's like a little bit paranormal and you can really show exactly what's happening through that character's eyes and how they're experiencing it. And also the exactly. unreliable narrator possibility is also very exciting. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I do like that. <laughs> yeah. So do you have, so what, what do you think the secret is? If you had to say one thing for how to scare your readers, what do you think makes a book really scary if you had to pick one thing? I tend to use things that I find scary. Um, a lot of people assume that if you write horror that you're not very easily scared, and I definitely am. I tend to use things that scare me in real life and just work those into my story or into my characters, or even if it's not something that scares me, something that will scare my character. As long as you can feel that fear and feed that fear into your, your main character in a realistic way. Um, like for an, an example of something that seems to crop up quite a lot with my books is there will be at least one scene in each of my books that is extremely driven by claustrophobia because that's one of mine. I hate being right. in a very confined space. Mm -hmm. So I, I tend to have at least one scene in each of my books that will have that element to it. And I think that helps me get into that sort of visceral writing mode so that yeah. I can make it real. Yeah, I mean, I think it helps as a horror author if you're scared of things because you can really get into the mindset of being terrified of what you're writing about. <laughs> it would be hard to write somebody feeling afraid if you didn't know what that felt like. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So finally, um, this is my last question. What is your best piece of advice for someone who wants to be a young adult horror writer? It's the same advice, really, that I would give to somebody writing in any genre is to really read widely within the genre you want to write. I read an awful lot of YA horror and thrillers. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps me to figure out what works or what I would do differently. It helps me to see what's already out there and has already been done really well or you know, not so well that I think maybe, maybe if I gave that a different twist, I could make that feel a bit fresh. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, to read widely within your genre and to learn from other writers as well. So basically to, to follow your channel because you give such <laughs> amazing advice. I think that's a really good one. <laughs> yeah, well, for everybody who's watching this interview, you're doing a good job. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming and talking with me today. I know everybody who's going to be watching this video is going to be so happy to hear what you have to say about this. Could you tell everybody where they could find you online and where they can find your books? Absolutely. And thank you very much for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Anybody watching can find me at catelliswrites.com. That's my website and all of my links are from there. Awesome. Perfect. Well, thank you so much again. <laughs> I'm going to stop Thanks the recording. <laughs> 
So that's it for my interview with young adult author Cad Ellis. I hope you enjoyed watching the video. If you did, please make sure to give it a like and to subscribe to my channel. I post videos about writing every week and I frequently interview other young adult authors who share their tips for how they like to write their books. Also, please go make sure to give Cat's books a read. I absolutely loved reading Bird and Falls and Hera Lake is another fantastic book and she's a really, really wonderful writer. So if you're looking for a great spooky season read, go check her out because I promise you, they will deliver. <laughs> I'll see you next time, everyone. And as always, happy writing.